This morning, we are going to dive right into the text. We're beginning a new series this morning called The City. Um, if you have your Bibles, John chapter 3, we're going to be looking at a passage that most of you probably know from memory. Um, John chapter 3, verse 16 is our text this morning. Uh, I'm going to look at John 3, 16. Also going to look at Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. One, two, and three. Those are our two main passages we'll be looking at. But I talked about last week about my upbringing, how I grew up in a Christian home. Both of my fo- parents are followers of Jesus. My dad's a pastor. My grandparents were pastors. Um, and so being raised in a Christian home, there are a lot of benefits to that. There are a lot of benefits to be, to growing up in something. But what I heard and not saying that this is true, is that Christianity is about me. I heard this in VBS. I heard this in Sunday school, in sermons. I heard a lot about my personal relationship with Jesus. I heard a lot about um, how my prayer life, my devotional life, my quiet time, my spiritual disciplines. And even as people started talking about evangelism and the idea of sharing the gospel with other people, it was very difficult for me to get over myself and my comforts in regard to that. What if they reject me? What if they, I don't know, stone me? I don't know what they'll do if, uh, if I start talking to them about Jesus. And so I was more concerned about my wants, my desires, my happiness. So after all, isn't God concerned about my joy and my satisfaction? And when we begin to talk about telling people about Jesus, some of us are hardwired to be self-absorbed. And unfortunately, a lot of that is because we've been raised up in churches that have spent a lot of emphasis on what we get out of our faith. We've been taught that our faith is about us and what we do to make Jesus happy and ultimately how we can make sure that we somehow make it to heaven. We struggle with the idea that Christianity is, some, is about something other than ourselves. May I suggest that there might be some of you in this morning that are intrigued by Christianity because of what it offers you. What benefits you get out of being a follower of Jesus? I don't think we'd ever say that out loud. None of us would ever say, I'm here because of what I get out of this. But we operate that way. We live our lives that way. And that became an issue for me as I began graduate school and even after I was in ministry and coming face to face with some of the realities that began to challenge my thinking that Christianity was all about myself. I can remember two truths that, began to, that God began to convict me of when it, what, it, what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. The first one, and this is critical, is that you have to make a fundamental decision about whether the Bible is about what you should do to find real life, or is the Bible about what God has already done for you to get real life. And there's a fundamental difference there that carries through in what type of church you're attracted to, why you read scriptures, why you pray. Is the Bible about you? Or is the Bible about a God that has reached out to you? The second is this. The God is a mission, and his fundamental posture toward the world is not to ruin and destroy the world, but to save and redeem and renew the world. His fundamental posture toward the world is not cursing, but it's blessing. His fundamental posture toward the world is not anger, but it's love. So you'll see places in Scripture that says that God is slow to love and abundant in anger, right? Um, You find that throughout Scripture, right? Um, Not really. You actually find the opposite, that God is slow to anger. He is abundant in love. His posture toward us is that He is a loving God. So when we begin to think about the city... And when I say the city, I talk about the people, the places that we live at, the environments that we're in, the people that live around us, the family members in our lives that don't know Jesus, the people that work with us, the individuals that go to class with us. You've got to realize that, yes, God will judge, and there will be a day of reckoning, but God's posture toward people is a posture of mercy. What will save our city, what will change our city is going to be a stunning, abundant mercy from God that is mediated through people like you and people like me. And, I was, and as I was working and realizing that, I began to read Scripture, and I began to see this throughout Scripture, that God, we serve a God who loves the world, and He is relentless 
in his love for the world. This morning, this series is very basic. It is not going to be deep, but it's a reminder that we serve a God who loves the world. I think most of us know that, but I don't think a lot of us have a deep conviction about that. We know this verse that we're going to read, John 3, 16, but do we get it? Do we have deep convictions about what the text says? And if we do see and if we do get it, are we actually doing it? Are we actually loving the world and our city the way that God loves our city? The series that we're beginning today is about God's love and plan for this city. And what I want to do today is show you from Scripture how God intends to reach the city, how God loves the city. And over the next few weeks, we're going to talk deeper, and we're going to get much more into Scripture on that. How do we love people well? How do we talk to people about Jesus? We will talk about how Jesus loves people, and we'll talk about how we love the way that Jesus loved. It'll be a very practical series, very tangible series. We'll eventually get into some hot-button topics. We'll talk about issues that divide us. We'll talk about how do we love people that are disagree with us politically. We'll end this series by talking about how do we love people that have a different sexual orientation from us. We're going to make this practical. We're going to talk about how do we live in a world that God loves and how do we love our neighbors. And so that's where we're beginning this week. And during this journey, my prayer is that this series will open your eyes to see how God will use the people in your life and that it will challenge you. For some of you, you'll see and hopefully you'll begin to change how you live your life. And this morning, what I want to do is I want to answer one question. Is how does God love our city? John 3, 16. You're familiar with the text. It's the most famous of biblical passages. It's a conversation between Jesus and a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus. And the conversation is about who Jesus is and what Jesus does. And here's what Jesus says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In this conversation about who is Jesus and what is Jesus doing and what's his ministry about, Jesus himself stops and he says, here's why I'm here. I'm here because God loves the world. And because he loves the world, two things happen. Number one, he doesn't want people to perish. He wants to put an end to death. He is putting death to death. And not only is he putting an end to death, he also wants to offer eternal life. I don't know about you, but when I hear that, oftentimes I always thought that this was talking about life after death. But I think in the context of this verse, Jesus isn't just talking about what happens when we die. He's talking about experiencing eternity here on this earth. The life on the other side of death is beginning to be experienced in this life, and that experience that we begin to experience life the way that it should be, the life we want, a life of human flourishing, a life where our relationship with God flourishes, a life where our relationships with others flourish, a life where our relationship with creation and everything that God's created flourishes. And when, we, when God loves us in such a way that our lives begin to flourish, we call that a blessing. So what I'm going to say is that the way that God intends to love our city is that he intends to bless our city. God is blessing our city, God has blessed our city, and God will bless our city. His fundamental posture to our city and the way he loves our city is by blessing our city. And the word bless goes all the way back, all the way back to the beginning of Scripture. And the root of that word literally means to bend the knee in service. Is that me? Um, right. So when we talk about blessing God... On how we bless God, that is us being devoted and kneeling and serving God. But when we talk about God blessing us, it's a little different because we're not the center of God's creation. God is the center of his creation. But in, bending, but, but in blessing us, in bending his knee toward us, it means that he is out for our joy. He's out to give us what we need most in life. He's out to give us the best. Think about a great band. Think about a band that's been around years or decades. What makes them great is not only do you cheer for them and you are devoted to them, but these bands that last a long time, 
they know how to entertain their fans. They know how to make a concert so exciting, so friendly that people want to pay tons of money to be there. It's, they're devoted to it. They can write music and put on a show that people will spend their savings for simply so they can see them in person. God blesses us. He loves us by giving us what is best, by being out for our joy and for our good. That's his posture toward us. That's what he does. But we need to see that from Scripture. And I'm going to give you an overview from Genesis all the way to Revelation this morning. We begin with the fact that God created a very good world. What we see in Scripture is that God created everything out of nothing. And at the end of each day of creating, Scripture says that he blessed. Blessing is a proclamation or a declaration of God saying that what he has done is good. So he creates a good world. He blesses it. He calls it good. And even when Adam and Eve reject and rebel against God, when they begin to trust in something other than God, even when the entire human project begins to fall apart and sin is everywhere, we get to Genesis 11 and man thinks that he's God and he's going to build a tower that goes all the way to heaven and God creates confusion and spreads humanity all over the world. In the middle of that story, we find a man by the name of Abraham or Abram a normal, average man who is simply living his life. And in Genesis 12, I want to read what I think is the core of the Bible. Beginning from Genesis 12 all the way to the end of the Bible, everything is rooted in this text and this story. John 3, 16 is explaining Genesis 12. And I want you to see the posture of God, a God of mercy, a God of grace, a God of love in this passage. See that for this man, Abraham? See that for his family? but also see us in the story. Here's what Genesis 12 says, verses 1 and 2. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and on your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And those who dishonor you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So God sends Abraham and his family out from the city. They were there when the tower was being built, and now they've been spread out. He's confused the languages of the people, and it's no longer a safe place to live. So people that speak the same language are gathering together, and they're becoming their own people group. And God's going, saying to Abraham, hey, as your family is moving, when they find a place to stay, you keep going. Don't stop. Keep going. You leave your family. Leave your father's house. Leave your father's possession. Leave your family's relatives and go to the land where I'm going to show you. And notice his promise of blessing. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you famous. I'm going, to make you a great, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you. God loves the world, and the way he intends to bless it is by taking this man and promising that he will give him a land and a family. He takes Abram, and he sets him aside. And you've got to ask, why does God choose Abram? instead of all the other families? Is it because he was the smartest? Is it because he was the most beautiful? Is it because he was the most attractive? Is it because he was the most influential in the community? Was it because he was the most successful? Not at all. None of those reasons. What we find consistently in Scripture is that when God chooses people, he chooses people simply because of his own good pleasure. And he also chooses people that recognize that Everything they have and everything they will be is because of God, that they will never boast in themselves. He loves them because he chooses to love them. He doesn't love us because of anything inherently good in us. He doesn't choose Abram because of something great in him. He chooses him because he is a great God and he does does as he pleases. And in choosing them, he sets them aside and says, here's how you should live. I'm choosing you. I'm setting you aside and helping you to see how you're supposed to live, that this is the way that life should work. I need the world to see that this is how the life is supposed to work. This is how life is supposed to go. This is what life is supposed to look like under the good and gracious rule of a sovereign God. And you know the story of Abram. His children begin to multiply and eventually become millions and millions of people and become the nation of Israel. And the nation struggles to believe that God is good. A struggle, they struggle to believe that God genuinely loves them. So they would run to hard times and they would run away from God. 
And even when he saves them and rescues them, they would still think that God was against them, so they would trust in other things and other gods. They look around and want to be like the other nations of the world. So they would come to the leaders like Samuel, and they'd say, Samuel, we need a king. Samuel says, you have a king. He's God. He knows exactly what's good for you. And they go, but that's not good enough. We want to be like the other people. We want to be like the other nations. We want a king. And here's the amazing thing about the God of the Bible. He will take your foolish nonsense and he will use it for a great and glorious purpose. He will call it what it is, wickedness, evil, and rebellion, but he is powerful enough, wise enough to take what you intend for evil and he will turn it to good. He gives them a king. He establishes a king, but he tells the king, you're not going to do this your way. You're going to do this my way. And what you see, particularly in the life of David and man after God's own heart, but still an adulterer and a murderer. And then through Solomon, who was the wisest and the smartest of all kings and the wealthiest, you see this being orchestrated in God's plan to bless the world through a particular be- people being played out. But that only lasts two generations because Solomon's son chooses to reject God and reject God's plan, and runs off with his own agenda, and the whole thing begins to fall apart, and the people are run out of their land, they're scattered, they're put into exile, and it seems like there's no hope until God blesses his people by sending the ultimate king of kings, the savior, the rescuer, the Messiah, the Christ. He is sent by God to bless the world, not by setting up a military kingdom, not by setting up a political kingdom, but by establishing the rule and reign of God in the hearts and minds of his people through his work of forgiveness and grace and freedom. The work is what we are experiencing this morning in our lives. The continuing work of God to bless the world until we get to the end of all things. And at the end of all things in Revelation, we find not only is God putting all things back the way it's supposed to be, not only is he making things like they were in the beginning, but he's actually making them even better than they were in the beginning. Listen, this is the mission of God. The mission of God is to love the world by blessing the world. And he blesses the world so that they might know him. Why is it that God loves you and blesses you? Because you need to know him. Why is it that God blesses our city and loves our city? Because our city needs to know him. Because in knowing this God, we are walking into the very heart of this word that we call blessing. When you think about blessing and love, we're talking about a world in which everything is the way that it should be. Everything that ruins and rusts and corrodes and rots and deteriorates has been removed. So there's nothing that's standing between us and God himself. Because when we talk about blessing, and we're talking about the blessing of God, ultimately what we're saying is that the blessing of God is God himself. He is the most valuable thing. We said earlier that blessing people and loving people is giving them what they need and what is best. And what we're saying is that God is the sum and substance of everything that's good. So when we experience God in this life, Not just when we die, he is what we want, he is what we desire, he is what we're created for. So I've got to ask you two questions that relate to that. The first is, do you believe that God has blessed you? I know there are particular people in Christianity that if you ask them if they're blessed, they'll respond, oh, I'm blessed. I mean, if you ask them how they're doing, they'll respond, oh, I'm blessed. Um, or my favorite, I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord, and they just walk around like that. Usually that means for them that life is good, relationships are good, there's money in the bank, there's no problems in life. That's what they mean by they're blessed. And I think there's some truth to that. When you read the Old Testament, you do see the blessing of God is holistic. It's not just spiritual. There is a way that God blesses you physically, emotionally, in your health. It's not just a spiritual blessing. There's tangible blessings from God. God says, I'm going to bless you with land. I'm going to bless you with money. I'm going to bless you with health. The problem is when we reduce the blessings of God simply to money and health and wealth and all that stuff. And we say that if you're not healthy or if you're not wealthy and if you're not successful, then you're not blessed. There's a problem there because the scriptures will not let you say that at all. 
So you're, the question is, are you blessed? Maybe your health is good this morning. Maybe you have money. Maybe life is good. But I mean more than that. Are you blessed? Regardless of where you're at this morning, you might have had a bad week. You might have had a great week. You might have had a bad morning. You forgot that the time changed this morning. Um, you're here, and this is your first year at UTD, and you've got the roommate from hell. You might, you might be suffering. I don't know. Or your relationships aren't going the way you thought it would go. The blessings of God are more than just the good things in life, even though it includes the good things in life. Are you blessed? Let me ask, are you alive? Are you breathing this morning? The blessing of God includes the fundamental idea that it is because of the grace of God that you woke up this morning. It is God's mercy that you were able to see another day. You're blessed. Have you been abandoned by God? Yeah, I know there's sometimes you feel like you feel that way or maybe your story might have seasons where you feel like God's not listening to you. You feel like he's forgotten you or rejected you or cursed you. Can I encourage you? God doesn't go back on his word. He says he'll never leave you. He says he'll never forsake you. You might feel like he's hidden. It might seem like he's not there, but he has not abandoned you. You are blessed. You're loved. Has he called you? Has he chosen you? You know, the Bible says that God chose us. If you're here this morning, it's not because you somehow found God. God found you. He made the first move. He initiated this relationship. He chose you. Can I be honest? Sometimes we wonder if he chose us. We live patterns of life that look nothing like the life that God intended for us. We're caught up in sin. We worry. We doubt. We fear. None of that which is from God. So we wonder if God really chose us. But how do you know? I would say this. You're here this morning, aren't you? It's kind of like Matthew McConaughey last week showing up at the Oscars and winning the Oscars and standing um, up there wondering, did you guys just really choose me? I mean, you, are in, you were invited, right? And we just did call your name, right? And you just did see everyone stand up and applaud you, right? And you are holding a trophy, right? You're here. The fact that we're here in this room this morning listening to the holy scriptures of God, the very word of God, is God saying he knows who you are, he wants you, he loves you, and he cares about you. You have been chosen by God. There is no reason for you to doubt that this morning. You are loved. You are cared for. You are called. You are chosen by God. But the way to that if he has caused you to wake up this morning instead of being dead, if he has not abandoned you, if he has chosen you, the weight of it is whether you believe it or not. That's on you. Do you believe that you are called? Do you believe that God has not abandoned you? Do you believe that God is the one that allowed you to wake up this morning? Do you believe that God loves you? So the question is, are you blessed? But there's a second question. Let's say you do believe that. See, if you look at Genesis 12 and God's command to Abraham or promise to Abraham, you see the posture is that God says, I love you, but the reason I love you is so that through your life you can be a blessing to people. So the first question is, are you blessed? The second question is, are you blessing the world around you? Jesus is going to say in a text that we're going to look at in a few weeks, as the Father sent me, so I will send you. What that means is that individually and corporately together, what God has done is he has basically sent Jesus onto a mission and he intends for us to join him on that mission. This is the work of the church, the group of believers together. We are part of the family and the family has a business and the business is to love the world, to bless the world, to bend the knee and serve the world so that the world might know that there is a God and that his posture toward them is that he loves them. That is our mission. 
So are you blessed? And are you being a blessing? Let me give you three reasons why we struggle with being a blessing to people around us. Number one, we don't even know what that means. We're supposed to be part of the family business, but we really don't know about the business and how it operates. And one of the things that happens is that we forget that this environment will not change our lives. It will change how you think. It will change how you feel. But we have to do more than just talking and listening. We've got to put our feet to the ground and live this out. We've got to be able to bless people around us. And other people, another reason we struggle to bless people is because we haven't built our lives around other people. We're following Jesus in isolation. Or we only hang around with people that are just like us. So take an inventory of your life. Do you have friends that don't know Jesus? Are there people in your life that need to be blessed because of you? Or are you isolated yourself and kept yourself into a cocoon where it's you, Jesus, and your group of friends that worship Jesus together? Do you realize that God has blessed you so that you can be a blessing? And the third reason, maybe this morning, is because maybe you don't belong to Jesus. There may be some of you in this room, you aren't blessing people because you yourself have not received the blessing of God in your own life. There's also a category for those of us who belong to the family, but we think we don't. We think we disqualified ourselves because of our own performance, something we've done, something that has been done to us. That's why we have to go back to the heart of the blessing of God. Does he respond to who you are? Or does he act first and call you to respond to who he is? Does he wait on you to fix yourself before he chose you? Or did he choose you and then began to work in your life? If you believe that you are disqualified from the blessing of God because of what you've done or your past, you have a fundamental fallacy and you're thinking about who God is. His posture toward you is based on who He is, not on what you've done. And He calls you to respond in light of who He is. Is it about Him, or is it about you? The great thing is that when we begin to get this, that God has blessed us and loved us so that we can bless and love our city, we really begin to believe it, and we begin to look for opportunities to bless people in tangible ways. It's going to take effort, it's, but it will produce results because we go knowing that God has called us to do this. So I'm going to give you a preview real quick of what we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks. If you want to know how to love somebody, take that word bless and turn it into an acronym, B-L-E-S-S. I know how to spell. Here's what you do. And I'm talking about how you bless someone individually. You have to begin by asking the question, is there someone that God has placed in your life that he's calling you to bless? Who's God placing in your life to touch? So B, begin with prayer. Listen, if there's no particular person that comes to your mind when I ask the question, who is God calling you to bless? Let me encourage you, start with prayer. Ask God, God, who is it in my life that you're calling me to? Who is it in my life that you want me to touch and impact? Who is it in my life that you want me to minister to? Because we can talk about generically loving our city and wanting to see our city saved, but never get down to who is God calling us to love in our city. So begin with prayer. If God has already given you someone, Again, begin with prayer. Don't go in your own power. Pray. Say, God, will you give me an opportunity to talk to this person? God, would you give me the words to say to this person? God, would you give me, would your spirit work through my life so they see Jesus in me? You begin to pray that God will bless them in such a way that they will see Jesus. You pray before you talk to them. You pray while you're talking to them. You pray after you leave them. You trust that God is the one working and that God, for some reason or another, wants to choose you to bless them. You begin with prayer. B. L. You listen. You have to listen, which means you have to initiate a conversation. You've got to talk to people. 
That might be a simply, hey, how you're doing? And you might have to do that the entire semester long, and they'll say good every day, but there might be one day when things are not going well, but because you asked, they might have said, things aren't going well today. But you initiated day in and day out, and you were faithful at it, and you were patient, trusting God. You were giving me, one day you're going to open up this door, help me to be faithful. And there might be that one day when life is a mess, and because you were there and you were listening, a door opened for a gospel conversation to happen. You got to listen. You got to talk to people. B, begin with prayer. L, listen. E, here's something we're good at. Eat. It's amazing as you walk through scriptures, particularly in the life and ministry of Jesus, how much conversations happen around a meal. How many deep conversations go on as they're just simply eating? And I'm using the word eat broadly because for some of you, it might just mean a simple cup of coffee. But sitting across the table from someone, listening to their story, maybe inviting them into your home and eating with them. I don't know if I'd call eating sacred, but there is something sacred about sitting across a table with someone, sharing a meal, and hearing their story. The table we celebrate, we celebrate it now, and it's just a little piece of bread and a little bit of juice. But when that actually happened, it was a whole meal. And we celebrate a meal that Jesus had with his followers. Eat with people. Pay for their coffee. If you can't afford it, take them to McDonald's and buy them something off the dollar menu. You can afford that. But take them out. Get to know them. Hear their story. Hear how is God working. Listen, what is God doing in their lives? Hear ways that you can be praying for them. Stop isolating yourself where it's just people, it's just you and God or just you and your other Christian friends. Invest into people. Eat with them. S, serve. You know, as you eat with them and you hear their story, what you're going to hear is how you can serve them. And maybe serving is different. Maybe it's, man, I've got a major exam this week. And you serving them is, hey, let me pray for you that God will give you wisdom. Because I believe that whenever I lack wisdom, I can pray and God gives that to me. Maybe it's, hey, I'm just struggling at home and it's just so much going on. And it's maybe you saying, hey, what if I took the kids off of you for a couple hours so you guys can rest? It's serving. It's finding practical ways to show them the love of Jesus, to show them that you care about them. Serve. The final S is story. None of this will matter if you're not willing to share your story with them and ultimately the story of God with them. The idea of blessing people involves bringing God into their conversation. So you share your story. Imagine when that happens in this city. Listen, I love all the events that we do. We do a lot of events as a church. They're needed to make our presence known in the community. But I have far less confidence in our events than I do in a bunch of you guys living out the idea of blessing people in our lives. That's what's going to make a difference. People are not going to show up at church because we put out a postcard in their mailbox. That's not how it works. They're going to show up because you invested in their lives, you cared about them, you loved them, you invited them. They're not just going to randomly walk in here for no reason. And if they do, they don't know anyone, they feel uncomfortable and they leave. But if you invest into their lives and you love them, and pour into them, then invite them. They already know you. They know you care. They'll be, they'll be welcome as part of the family. Invest into people. Bless people. You know, when Jesus left the earth, he didn't just hand his mission to us and we don't replace Jesus. We believe that Jesus is still working and we are actively involved. That the mission of Jesus being worked out is being worked out through us. 
at the heart of it, it means that the reason that we exist is so that people might know Jesus and what he is, who he is and what he's done. That is why we are here. And as I close, when we talk about the blessing of God and how God loves us and how God wants to bless our city and how God wants to bless us, if you want to see the love of God clearly in the events of human history, the one place you look at is the cross. Because at the heart of blessing is giving someone what they need most. And what all of us need most is forgiveness. And what Jesus does on the cross is offer us an avenue to be forgiven and made right with God, giving us what is best. It is there on the cross where justice and mercy collide, where we see the blessing of God is not just consumed in an event or in an action, but the blessing of God is found in a person. We don't worship a cross And we're not thankful for a cross. We're thankful for the person who gave his life on the cross so that we could be forgiven. A person. The posture of Jesus is that he came to love and that in loving means he came to forgive us of all of our shame and all of our guilt and to free us from a life of destruction. Our hope is Jesus. And because of Jesus... I pray that we will grow in our passion to love our city and love our neighbors and love the people around us. This morning, as we do every week, we're going to come back to the communion table to remind us that we have been loved by God. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He showed his love by giving us his best. Let me remind you of the verse we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You are loved. You are blessed. And that is because of Jesus. As we come to the table this morning, I'm going to invite you to examine your attitudes, your affections, your actions from this past week. Were you living for yourself? Was your life consumed about you? I pray the Holy Spirit will convict you and remind you that you have been blessed. Not because you deserve it, but you have been blessed so that you can be a blessing to others. So you can make Jesus famous through your life. So as we come to the table, would you examine your heart And whenever you are ready to come and grab the elements, I invite you to come, grab it. The worship team will sing, and I'll come up in a few moments, and we'll partake together. Let's worship.